Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and it's time for part two of the Monday Q&As. So let's do it. First question. All lifts going up except squat and not for lack of trying, which has been stuck undulating between 120 and 130 kilograms for 3x5 for about seven months. That is a long stall. Could I be on too much volume? My deadlifts seem to be responding very well to low volume as I can now pull 205 kilos doing ramping sets uh, in sessions a week, doing two ramping sets. Okay. Yeah, it does seem like your deadlift is responding better to a little less volume and your lifts are not really particularly proportionate. I would say you are progressing faster on your deadlift than your squat. It could be your situation, a couple of different things going on. It could be that you could be doing too much volume to get stronger at this point on your squat and it has stalled a bit. Or it could be that your deadlift is eating in the recovery on your squats. I would lean more towards the former, that you have basically exhausted your ability to progress well using the type of rep range and volume you're using. It is time for you to start periodizing. You, you peaked out and hit kind of a true intermediate level on your overall lifting a bit faster than some people do on the squat by just a small margin but you're pretty well there i mean if you're doing 130 for sets of five you're pretty well there so it is time for you to start periodizing your training a little bit on the squats consider going heavier for a little while dropping down to some three by three occasionally doing some singles and and adjusting it so that you can lift a heavier weight before you go back and doing a slightly higher rep work with the fives again but it is time for you to start changing your rep ranges up a little bit using some basic periodization if you're at that point. You just kind of reach the limits of what you can do using a linear type method with intermediate volume. So yeah, it's time for you to start adding a little more weight, dropping the reps down a little bit and see if you get stronger based upon that. If that isn't enough, it might be time for you to back the deadlifts down just a hair and take one lighter day instead of those two heavy days every week on the deadlift also on top of that and see if that helps bring your overall recovery up enough combined together to, to get past that stall. All right, next question. How effective is recompositioning for general fat loss and maintaining strength versus slow cutting? Say a person is not competitive but enjoys recompositioning more than slow cutting. In all honesty, you're going to lose fat faster and more effectively on a slow cut. And if you do it slow enough, you shouldn't lose much of any strength. Whereas in recompositioning, it is a slower process. That, that is the thing to remember. Recompositioning is nice because you never have to feel like you're not making progress because you're always working towards improving everything. But the, the amount that you will get done per year is going to be slower on a recomp versus doing very slow bulks and cuts like clean bulking and then slow cutting is going to give you better total changes at the end of the year than recomping for a year straight it's just the nice thing is that with a recomp you don't ever feel like you're having to compromise one goal for another but you are compromising speed so you will always lose fat more quickly on a slow cut than you will a recomp and your net results in the long term will come a little faster doing it that way all right, next question. How do I keep my glutes tight when squatting? When I step out of the rack, my whole body is nice and tight, but when I sit my hips back and start to squat, I feel all the tightness leave my glutes. It's not a problem. I can complete reps with good form and my weights are still progressing, but feel if I could keep my glutes tighter, I could lift heavier. No, you really can't. There's a lot of things you want to keep tight you don't have to keep your glutes tight. It's not necessarily advantageous. If your glutes get a little loose near the bottom, that's perfectly normal. In fact, I don't even think you really can keep your glutes tight all the way down. I mean, you could try, but I don't think you're gonna get any mechanical advantage out of it. So don't worry about it. Just keep doing your thing. Make sure that you're keeping things like your, your upper back, your scapula tight, all of that. Your glutes don't necessarily need to be tight. And in fact, the when you're talking about sitting back, be careful that your squat technique and the type of squat you're doing is set up for you to sit back because you don't necessarily sit back on all types of squatting. I don't sit back on the squat. You'll notice that I do a high bar squat, so I don't sit back, I sit down. So just some things to keep in mind there. I wouldn't worry about trying to keep your glutes tight. It, it doesn't work that way, you don't need to. All right, next question. Thoughts on the anabolic effect of chocolate. Is it worth it? Are the gains you get out of it significant? Are the anabolic effects of chocolate worth it? 
hell yeah they are chocolate's awesome now in all honesty yeah i love chocolate i think most people love chocolate problem with chocolate well to put it bluntly the problem with chocolate is the same thing that makes it awesome chocolate is very calorically dense and it tastes good so you can eat a lot of it and get a lot of calories in calories are anabolic if you're having trouble getting enough calories in chocolate's amazing for gaining muscle and getting an anabolic effect the downside is that it tastes good and it's really easy to get a lot of calories in which makes gaining fat a problem when eating a bunch of chocolate so is it worth it, it really depends on the individual I would say most people can work in a bit of chocolate into their diet no matter what and be fine because chocolate is awesome but it, it can be problematic and if you're just eating a bunch of extra chocolate you might be getting fatter than you want to get when you're bulking because it is really easy to indulge and overeat in it but as far as it having a legitimate anabolic effect of course it does any high calorie food like that that is calorically dense is anabolic because calories and energy in and of themselves are anabolic And mainly, I just wanted to talk about chocolate. All right, next question. Now that some time has passed, have any of your opinions on BioGrow changed? Heard anecdotal evidence of all day pump and decreased DOM slash recovery time. I don't buy it. It'll put pounds of muscle on you, but the recovery seems beneficial. Why would my stance have changed? Either they are putting in the product what is on the ingredients list, or they are not putting in the product which is on the ingredients list. If that list is accurate, it is not only banned in sports, and if you take it, you are cheating, it's also not effective in the form that it's in for you to take orally. You would have to inject BioGrow to actually get benefits from it, but that doesn't make it any less cheating just because you're taking an injectable drug orally that doesn't make it effective doesn't mean you're not putting it in your body and cheating. So basically, if what's on the label is correct, then you're not natty, but you're also not getting any gains from it. If you are getting these benefits that they're describing, what is on that product list cannot do that. So therefore, there is something else in the product or you're getting a placebo effect. It's pretty straightforward, guys. Why would my opinion change unless they've changed the ingredients, unless they're changed what they're putting in it? The data hasn't changed. The information hasn't changed. It's either one or the other. Either the label is accurate or it is not. If it's accurate, I've already told you what the effects are. If it's not accurate, then well, then who knows what the effects can be. And until I see reason to believe otherwise, I have no reason to believe that they have labeled it inaccurately. I'm taking the company's word for it. And if their label is accurate and they are being honest, then it is a banned drug in sports and it sucks at the same time. All right, next question. How to get back into deadlifting after taking a long time off of them, six plus months. You know, I did the same thing myself. When I got back into training, I started deadlifting again, but I was using straps because at the gym I was at, I didn't have access to the, the right bars. I was using a really smooth, really large diameter bar, so I was using straps. I got up to 240 for a max, and then I quit deadlifting for seven months, and then I came back and started deadlifting again after I had changed gyms before I started training at home. And I just started light. Since I no, knew I had done 240 before, I ended up building up and doing 200 for a triple my first time back. And then I added every single time I came in and trained to deadlift, which was twice a week at that time, I just added five kilos and tried to do triples with five kilos heavier up until I got to something like 235 for a triple. And then I started dropping down and doing singles and other things again. So all you do is just come back slowly. Now, if you know that you've got stronger on your other back movements and your squats, then odds are you haven't lost any deadlift strength. You've only lost technique and motor learning. The muscle strength should still be there. So just trim it down 10 to 15% under what you were using before or even 20% lower and just ease back into it slowly. It's pretty straightforward. If you haven't gained strength or you've lost strength in say your barbell rows, and your squats and things like that, then you might need to scale it back further than 20% as you build back up from what you were using. But if you've gotten stronger on those lifts, you'll be surprised how fast your deadlift will come back to where it was after six months off. And it won't be long before you pass what you were doing. All right, next question. 
Hi Jason, in a few months my wife and I will be having our second child. Congratulations. Due to this, I won't be lifting as much and when I do recommence, it is likely to only be once a week until the baby grows up a bit anyway. I figured the best way to try to maintain strength would be for that one day a week to just go in, squat, bench, and deadlift and get out. Would you agree with this approach and if so, what weight rep ranges would you suggest? As above, I'm not expecting to increase strength, just retain as much as possible. Thanks, Jason. I'm going to recommend you do more than those three lifts. Now, if all you can squeeze in is one day a week, remember, everyone has the same 24 hours. You could probably get more in if you're efficient with your time. But assuming that you really and truly can only get the one day, I would squat, bench, deadlift. I would do some sort of row and some sort of overhead press. Okay. What I would recommend, since you've only got that one day, you figure maybe an hour, get in and do three sets of three with 85% of your one rep max. You might even be able to progress from there, just expect it to be very, very slow progression, like 10 pounds per year or less on the big lifts, but you could still progress doing that in theory. Just not that easy to do it. It would be very, very slow. But three sets of three with 85% on those five exercises, not those three, because you want to keep some balanced uh, development and that the three lifts alone aren't going to do that but that should be enough to sustain your strength and possibly give you some very very small increases in strength over time so that's what i would recommend there all right next question and last question of the week who makes the best athletes no this is a tough one rugby union and league or nfl players you know in terms of the actual training and the demands of the sports I'm going to have to say that the actual demand side of it, rugby and American football are pretty well equal in the, uh, the athleticism that is required to be good at it, and that the actual training and the play style of the sports themselves demand. They're equal in that regard. As far as who produces the best athletes, I think it's fair to say, and this is going to be there's a reason why is going to be the NFL. And that's not American bias. It's the fact that we have a much, much larger genetic pool to draw from for the NFL. The NFL draws from the entire United States. Rugby is mostly the UK with some other countries in the mix who also have other big sports that pull a lot of their best athletes out. It isn't the dominant sport in any country and not in any big country. American football is pretty well our dominant sport in the United States, a country of over 300 million people. As such, because it pays so much money, it has such a massive gene pool to draw from, and it is generally the most popular sport, with some others that are very, very close. But because it is the most popular sport in such a big country, it has a very, very massive gene pool to draw from in terms of people who have a lot of athletic ability, it draws the best of the best. So it just has a much, much larger gene pool to draw from to develop athletes. And so when you either sport puts the same amount of demands upon the athlete and similar needs in terms of athleticism, the one that is getting better genetics due to having a much larger pool to draw from and to be selective with, it's going to produce better overall athletes. So it's nothing against rugby, it's purely a demographics issue. Because rugby is a very serious, tough sport. And any, anyone over in America who's never seen rugby, who, who doesn't realize how tough of a sport it is, go watch it. It, it, is, it is a man sport all the way. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it has been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time. But let me give you guys a bicep shot before I go. Oh, Mount Bicepia.